In today's episode, we're going to be talking about saying goodbye to a cute and monstrous pet. That's right. We're talking about Discovery, Season 1, Episode 5, Choose Your Pain. Welcome, everybody, to Trek in Time, where we're talking about each episode of Star Trek. We're reviewing them in chronological order. We're also taking a look at the world at the time of original broadcast. So currently, we are taking a look at Discovery. We're still in Season 1, so we're in 2017. And who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I've written some sci-fi. I've written some stuff for kids, including a soon-to-be-released new adventure series, which starts off with The Sinister Secrets of Singe, which will be coming out at the time of this broadcast just a couple of weeks from now. It'll be in the first week of June. I hope you'll be interested in checking that out. And if you want to know more about that, you can find out more at my website, seanfarrell.com. And with me, as usual, is my brother, Matt. He's the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I don't have a book coming out, but I'm very excited for your book. <laughs> I can't well, wait. Well, I appreciate the interest. I've recently discovered that people in my life are surprisingly interested in supporting me in my efforts to get <laughs> word of my book out. I'm surprised this, <laughs> in the form of starting to put together a reading here in New York City where I would be talking about and reading some of the new book and thought nothing of saying nothing to anybody in my life until my partner was like, you got to tell the family and suddenly all the family is coming. So are you going to share information about where that reading is going to be in case people want to go to it? It will be in June. I will share more information as we get closer to then, but it will be All in right. June. And there's going to be a reading in Manhattan around the 24th, and there will be another one on the 25th. And as more information becomes available, I will certainly let people know. But before we get into today's discussion around this week's episode, Matt, I understand you've got some viewer comments you wanted to share from our previous one. Yeah, there's... I got to say that the comments over the past few episodes have been fantastic. <laughs> it's like the switch from Enterprise into this has brought out some interesting conversation. There's a couple of comments that had me uh, chuckling pretty hard. Uh, one from Drew Lovely that said, choose the pain of watching Lorca eat a full meal or the pain of the tardigrade fight scene. This is from uh, my request that people weigh in with... Yeah what they think the next episode, today's episode, Choose Your Pain yes. would be about. And I said, wrong yes. answers only. Yes. I love those. And then there's one from Dan Sims that says, Choose Your Pain is all about hot peppers. Now, remember that it's not just about how hot it is going in, but also coming out. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. It's Thank like you, a wormhole, Dan. right, Dan? No. Okay. All right. A very Bernie wormhole. Yes. Okay. But then there were a couple of comments. We have one from Pelgo69. You know, the show gets a lot better when you completely tune out all of the Star Trek window dressing. These aren't professional Starfleet personnel who are the best humanity has to offer. This is a story about a rogue starship fighting an authoritarian empire in the same vein as Andromeda. I don't think that's necessarily wrong because there's an aspect of this that is like Trek we aren't used to. Yeah. But it's still Trek-like. It's fun sci-fi. And if you kind of in your mind, separate Star Trek from this, you can have a lot of fun with the show, even if you don't feel like it feels like Trek. I, th I thought it was kind of a fun comment. And then the last one was from Jason Dumb. The older Trek was able to develop characters more deliberately with much longer seasons. Discovery was handicapped by the shorter season length and the decision to focus more on fewer characters. Speaking of characters, Lieutenant Barkley is not my favorite, and it feels like Star Trek Discovery has a lot of Barclays. <laughs> That's, <laughs> I, li <laughs> I like that description. That's great, Jason. Uh -huh. Yes, I just love that. Just had to share it. Now for today's episode, that noise in the background is, of course, the read alert, which can mean only one thing. It's time for Matt to try and tackle the Wikipedia description. And I think you'll notice, Matt, that there's been a change in how the Wikipedia descriptions look and are formatted yet again. There's been another evolution. There's a point where the episodes of Discovery stop having their own pages in Wikipedia. Oh, boy. I think it's too recent to show. And it went up to last week. And I anticipated that, like Enterprise, there would just be a Wikipedia page for each and every episode. Not the case. 
So we've hit a point where what we have from Wikipedia is literally a summary page of each episode, but all on one page. And whoever did this, I think, did a fairly good job. So let's see what you have to think about their summary of Choose Your Pain. Okay. Choose your pain. After a month of successful operations, Lorca is ordered to protect the spore drive until it can be replicated for other Starfleet ships. As he returns to the Discovery, Lorca is taken captive by a group of Klingons led by Laurel. Burnham has grown growing concern by the toll the drive has taken on Ripper, which is the tardigrade, along with Stamets' partner, Medical Officer Hugh Culber. Burnham convinces Stamets to find an alternative to run the drive. Lorca is imprisoned with captured Starfleet officer Ash Tyler and human criminal... Harry Mudd. That's a fun one from the old series. Mm -hmm. In the discussions, Loka reveals that he killed his entire crew during an earlier battle to spare them from the Klingon's torture, but escaped himself. Lorca is tortured by Lorel, who wants to learn the secret behind Discovery's new form of travel, but Lorca and Tyler escape before the Klingons can learn anything about it. For the final jump needed to escape the Klingons with Lorca and Tyler on board, Stamets connects to the spore drive himself using Ripper's DNA. Later, Burnham frees Ripper while Stamets' reflection in a mirror does not walk away when he does. <laughs> that is the weirdest description, Sean. It's it's not bad. Hits all it's the points. It's not bad. But it it's a little weird for points. a description. Yeah. yeah. It's a little weird. This episode, which originally aired on October 15th, 2017, was directed by Lee Rose from a story by Gretchen J. Berg and Aaron Herberts and Kemp Powers with a teleplay by Kemp Powers. And... Sonequa Martin Green, Doug Jones, Shazad Latif, Anthony Rapp, Mary Wiseman, Jason Isaacs, Jane Brooke, Mary Chifo, Wilson Cruz, and Rain Wilson are our main actors. At the time of broadcast, October 15th, 2017, what was going on in the world? Well, Matt was dancing his little heart out once again to Bodak Yellow by Cardi B. This song first appeared as the number one streaming song a couple of weeks earlier. It was replaced for one week by Rockstar by Post Malone. And now she's returned to the number one spot with a paltry 47.9 million downloads for the week. And at the movies, well, Matt, I know that you've got the Blu-ray version of this movie. That's right. It's the comedy slasher Groundhog Day Scream mashup, which was Happy Death Day. It earned $26 that was a movie? million. Wait, wait, wait. Dollars. That, that was a movie? It was a movie. <laughs> I think you're making that up. I feel like this is no. an alternate reality. Directed by Christopher Landon, written by Scott Lobdell, and starring Jessica Roth and Israel Broussard. It is the story of somebody at a frat party who continues to re-experience their own grisly death. Oh, now I remember. Okay. Yep. And on television, what else were we streaming if we weren't streaming Discovery? Well, we've already gone through some of the top programs for 2017 game of thrones number one walking dead number two pretty little liars on freeform at number three with 6.5 million and at number four a surprising entry the fourth most streamed show in 2017 was the show vikings on the history channel which <laughs> would earn almost six million streams per episode and in the news what was going on october 15th 2017 from the new york times the headline being promise the moon easy for trump but now comes the reckoning <laughs> on issues like health care and iran president trump's language has not been matched by action raising questions on whether his base will be satisfied by partial steps there was also concern about hacking of voting machines with new equipment and security protocols being examined as a result of concerns about Russians meddling in the 2016 election. And on the world front on this day in 2017 was the beginning of the Battle of Kirkuk, part of the 2017 Iraqi Kurdish conflict. It was a military deployment by the Iraqi security forces to retake Kirkuk from the Peshmerga after the latter ignored repeated warnings to withdraw, sparking clashes between the two forces. The advance began today on October 15th, 2017, with the city of Kirkuk being retaken the following day. The International Coalition described the events as coordinated movements, not attacks, with most of the Pershmarga withdrawing without fighting. So in this episode, we're looking at a couple of different things. The end of what I would argue is the first third of the storytelling for Discovery 
in the form of a transition from the tardigrade being the focal point of their drive system. We also get our first glimpse of something from the original series being planted in as a character element in the series in the form of Harry Mudd. And we get a nice little callback to Enterprise and some deeper Star Trek lore when we see Saru ask the computer to put together a list of the top five captains in Starfleet. And we see Jonathan's or Jonathan Archer's name pop in. Yep. So right out of the gate, the episode begins with a conversation between the Starfleet admirals and Captain Lorca and Lorca being told you've got to protect this asset and Lorca's yep. attitude being we should be using this asset in order to bring swifter victory to the Federation. And after this conversation takes place, Lorca en route back to discovery is captured by the Klingons. As far as a setup for an episode, how did this opening strike you? I hated it. <laughs> That'd be the nicest way to put it. It made no sense to me. It's like, why, how, how far did his shuttle have to go? Like wh how far was, why did the discovery have to be that far away? Couldn't the discovery have like been right next to it and beamed him over? Like what, what I don't understand why, why it, it makes no sense as to why that was the choice they made to set this up of if the discovery is so important, <laughs> they would have established a scenario where this could have even happened. I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah. yeah. I think this is a case of the show being captured by its own creative setup. They've mm -hmm. proposed a ship that has a warp drive that goes beyond anything we've ever seen. So the ship can literally go anywhere in the galaxy at mm -hmm. any time. Mm -hmm. So why is the ship not there? Mm -hmm. Point number one. Point number two, yep. as you mentioned, why are they not just beaming him to and from whatever meeting place this is? So that's yep. point number two. Point number three, it's all done for the convenience of allowing Lorca to be captured. Yep. So it's this kind of hodgepodge, like they could have done anything to indicate that, well, Lorca had to go to this critical meeting and Discovery was meanwhile ferrying supplies to another part of space. They could have suggested right. anything to give us a reason as to why this is all happening. But once Lorca is captured, the reasoning behind all of this becomes painfully obvious. And I found it a little jarring. It took me out of the episode a little bit of like, come on, you got to like, I understand that you want Lorca to be captured. That's the only reason you've done any of these things. So we get him in conversation with the Admiralty and he is arguing his point. And then post this conversation, he has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Cornwell, who says that as his friend, she is encouraging him to be less combative, to be less focused on the needs of him and his ship alone and take the big picture because he is harming himself. How did you take that conversation between him and Cornwell as far as her saying, I am your friend and what that does for our understanding of him as a captain and what's going on with the larger story? So taking my, how much I hated the whole setup of the plot device I did like this conversation. I did like this yeah. scene because it gave a little more of a behind the scenes of what is, what is Lorca? What are some of his motivations? Why is he doing this? Oh, he actually has friends. He's not an out, he is kind of an outsider and here's a friend trying to help him. There's also part of that conversation was around Burnham around. Why did you choose her? Because she is a symbol of what we are against. And by having her, you're sending the wrong message and people yeah. are kind of railing at that. So I like that that was brought up. So from a kind of character discussion, I like this scene a lot. I agree. I think that what they're doing very well in this moment is they're focusing this episode on Lorca in a way they haven't done before. In the previous episodes, we've seen him not as a mustache twirling villain, but we've seen him as the reclusive mad scientist mm -hmm. right down to the laboratory filled with nefarious looking devices and the skeletons and remnants of alien species and technologies that we don't understand. So he's been played up to this point very much as the 
he's got machinations and he's got plans within plans and he's keeping everything very close to the vest. And this one, they don't reveal what the ultimate plan is, but they do humanize him more and it creates more depth for the character. And it's two key elements. I think it's a nice balance to the episode that at the one side, it's this argument of, I will do whatever I have to, to ensure the war ends. And that's the conversation he has with the Admiral basically saying your concern is nice, but I don't have to share in that in order for us to remain friends or even for me to do my job. The flip side, and it's a nice balance is that toward the end of the episode, we hear the history of what cost Lorca his original captain seat, which was the destruction of his of his ship and the loss of his crew and his decision to blow his ship up himself and sacrifice them rather than let them be captured by the Klingons. And he sees this, he's had to, he frames it as he has to view that as the humane decision to make as the captain that Mm -hmm. killing his own crew was preferable to letting them fall into the hands of the Klingons. It is a strange and unusual perspective on a Starfleet captain. We haven't seen, and we talked about this a couple of episodes ago, things in Discovery that we haven't seen in Star Trek before. Yep. The captain who is dishonored by his own actions is not something that we've truly seen to this scale. The closest I can think of is Cisco from Deep Space Nine, who's Mm -hmm. introduced originally as being given a command on a station to basically end a dead end career. He'll never be a captain because of personal choices he's made. And it ends up with him in a position where he's, he's basically being put somewhere. And the, the start of DS nine includes a scene with Picard basically saying, I don't know if you're the right person for this job because this is, a delicate scenario where you're going to be dealing with Bajor and the contentious relationship with the Cardassians. And I don't know if you're up to this job. That's the closest we've had really Janeway right from the beginning. The big element of of Voyager is of course, she's dealing with half of her crew being former freedom fighters. That's the big Mm -hmm. element there. And Picard, when we start in next generation and the original series, when we start those series, we see some of the most well-respected captains in Starfleet already Mm -hmm. in, you know, well into their career. So it's a different scenario to say, here's a captain who looks like he should be the age where he's got good experience and he should have the respect of the admirals. And he does to a certain degree, but there's some black cloud hanging over him. And it seems both historical in the form of the events that led to this. It also seems to just be personality type and yes, without going into, you know, like I know what we're headed toward if anybody, and and I'm less inclined to give spoilers now than I am when we did enterprise enterprise is a 20 year old show. So when we said, Oh, well, as we all know, the third season is where it gets good. That to me, doesn't yeah. seem all that uncomfortable to say because it's a 20 year old program. Discovery might be different. Some of our viewers and listeners might not have originally watched it in 2017. That's only six years ago. So I'm less inclined to say like, Oh, as we all know, blah, blah, blah. But without giving anything away, what do you take away from this episode? As far as what they're doing with Lorca, do you agree that this is a unique take on a captain or did it, do you find it distracting in a way that goes back to some of the comments we've seen where it doesn't quite feel like star Trek? It doesn't quite at this point in the storyline for him, it doesn't quite feel like star Trek to me. It still feels like it's a little outside, especially when it's dropped that he basically blew up his previous ship. It's like, that feels so not star Trek. It feels like that guy would have been drummed out of Starfleet. So there's a question as to like, okay, we need more facts about that story because why the hell is he even still in charge if that's what he did? 
because it seems like a, a line that would be inappropriate to cross. So for me, it does feel a little out of Star Trek, but <laughs> without giving anything away, there's stuff that Lorca does in, in the rest of this season and next season that suddenly all of this kind of starts to sort of make sense. And I say sort of because, again, it still feels out of Starfleet, but at least we now have a really firm grasp as to what the hell is going on with this character. So the long view, I like what they did here. In the short view, I still think it's highly problematic. Does that make sense? It, I'm trying to dance around does. the whole, I'm trying to dance around everything, yeah. a little tap dance. So I want to, I want to jump now to the last element having to do with Lorca and I, th and then we can move on to what the storyline on Enterprise was during this episode in prison on the Klingon, Klingon prison ship, which it's unclear to me, like the elements of, of where they are They're they're They capture Lorca. The Klingons capture Lorca. It is clearly Lorel right out of the gate. When you first see Klingon storming the shuttlecraft to grab Lorca, they quickly mm -hmm. kill the, the pilot and you see Lorel in the crowd of Klingons coming in to capture him. And then he is in a prison and we see some sequences around what prison aboard the, this Klingon vessel looks like. And there are Klingons who come in and know just enough universal English to be able to say, choose your pain and then dispatch a beating onto whichever prisoner is selected by the prisoners. So you have a couple of prisoners and somebody says, take him or take me. That individual then gets a beating, which culminates in, it seems like the Klingons who are responsible for this have a certain move that they like to do the whole, I'm going to beat you up until you're on the ground. And then I'm going to casually walk away and then spin around and kick you in the head. And it's yes. the spinning kick that appears to kill an individual right in front of Lorca and mud. And we see Harry mud is introduced now as a man who is not quite as old as he is in the original series. We of course remember Harry mud as the grifter trader gentleman who's responsible for among my favorite episodes, creating a planet full of androids that are all based on women that he wishes he could have sex with. And only one that is representative of his wife, Stella. Here we see a younger Harry Mudd who has recently married Stella. And we understand mm -hmm. that as a result of marrying Stella, he's gotten himself in massive debt because he tried to buy her a moon and it, well, eventually those loan sharks come a calling. He fled into Klingon space, got captured, and has now figured out the best way to protect himself in prison, which is to work as a pigeon, as a stool pigeon in the cell. And he plays a game with Lorca where he's he points out, you need to know when to take the beating and you need to, need to know when to pass the beating off. He's figured out how to survive. So in prison, we see the introduction of Ash Tyler. We see Lorca meet another Starfleet person. He recognizes the uniform, of course, right away, and then begins to feel out both Tyler and Mud. And we will learn that Lorca is playing kind of three-dimensional chess. He's dropping information separately to each of them to see what information comes back to him from the Klingons. He anticipates that somebody is going to be eavesdropping, and when he identifies that it's mud, he quickly dispatches mud little mud's little insect friend. So we see a prison sequence which involves multiple beatings. We see the scramble for everything from food to just some sense of safety within this environment. And Lorca is playing this many moves ahead sort of strategy. We see a torture sequence with Lorca where his Weakness oh, with his eyes brutal. is used to the Klingon advantage by prying his eyes open and then just using bright lights. I believe there were four lights. I, I was going to make that joke. <laughs> <laughs> what oh, did you Sean. think about the whole sequence depicting what it's like to be a prisoner of the Klingons? We've seen Klingon prisons before. We've seen them yeah. going way back in the movies. We've seen them in the story of the Star Trek, the motion picture number six. And we also have seen them in enterprise, but here we see this is taking it up a notch. It takes it up a notch, but at the same time, I was expecting it to be a little more brutal, like looking, 
but they did a good job of you know making it very clear here these two guys two thugs come in and beat the crap out of you then drag you out <laughs> it was i i liked the whole depiction of how the klingons treat their prisoners i enjoyed the this sounds horrible to say. I enjoyed the torture scene. I liked the torture scene, the way it was played out, especially the fact that they knew so much about Lorca to knew, know how to take advantage of his Achilles heel. And like yeah. when they revealed what they were doing to him, you could see on Lorca's face, uh, oh no. <laughs> like yeah. he realized what they were about to do to him. Um, so I, I, I really enjoyed how they played it out. And it made it a little more interesting than what we've seen in the past, because in the past, the Klingons are just like brutes, you know, just like. It's all honor and like, I'm strong. I'm going to beat you up. This one, it showed a little more of a intellectual yeah, playing with their food before they kill it kind of a thing of like the whole p pitting people against each other. The fact that Harry Mudd is a stool pigeon, the fact that they're trying to infiltrate to find out everything they can that way. The fact that they're using his eyes against him. All those things are things that we would have never seen in Klingons in the past. And I enjoyed that layer of the brutality was still there, but then there was this like intellectual kind of addition to it that kind of amped yeah. it up a level to me. Yeah, it played up on the idea of honor is in the eye of the beholder because the things yeah. that they're doing are not ultimately honorable things to do from our perspective, but within the confines of the Klingon logic, everything they're doing in order to win this war is perfectly honorable. So they know that there's a weapon out there that can do things that they don't understand and they want to get their hands on it. So any ends will justify that or any means will justify that. The performances here from Jason Isaacs as Lorca mm -hmm. and from Shazad Latif who plays Ash Tyler, I think are terrific. The two of them yeah. having that kind of dance around each other when they first are introduced to each other. And you can tell Lorca is testing Tyler's you can see, story. He is you testing, can see he's so like, dubious. He's just like he's dubious about hell? this individual. He's just <laughs> like, so yeah. what how did you get here? What happened? What what brought you to this this place? And Ash's story is just as simple as like I was captured at the Battle of Binary Stars. I that was the beginning and end and middle of that. And it and it sounds brief, but also fleshy enough. And Lorca has a little bit of a back and forth and then a similar back and forth with, with mud. And when his words are quoted back to him during the torture scene with Laurel, he immediately returns to the cell and reveals that mud has been eavesdropping and recording their conversation. So he now knows you know, that he can't trust him. It's at this point that mud reveals that he knows who Lorca is and what Lorca has done in the past. And you get the sense that Lorca's shame around this is a major driving force in how he approaches being a captain. And you also get the sense that his shame of this, he didn't want this coming out in front of Ash Tyler in the way it has. So there's kind yep. of a soul bearing moment and Ash Tyler moves past it with a plum. He's got no problem with this. And there's a sequence of choose your pain where the Klingons show up yet again to basically clean house and the two Starfleet personnel turn the tables on them to Harry Mud surprise. I guess the idea of actually trying to attack the guards, Has none never of the other Starfleet mind. people ever did that. Like nobody no. else tried to do that. No, nobody ever came no. up with that plan. But Ash says, I knew escaping would take two people and I knew you were the wrong person, Harry Mud. And they leave Mud. And this is again, the same mm -hmm. your your parents captain of a Starfleet ship. Lorca basically says, screw you, we're going home and knocks yes. mud back this... into the cell and closes the door on him to leave him as a prisoner of a Klingon prison ship. Well, this, I this cannot right think of comment. one other captain yeah. who would have done anything close to that. <laughs> this ties right back to what Pale Ghost 69 said. It's like you have to kind of divorce yourself of like, oh, this isn't Star Trek. It's just fun sci-fi. And right. if you look at it from that point of view, this whole sequence is great. But if you look at it from 30, 40 years of Star Trek and you're watching this, you're like, what is happening right now? No yeah. Starfleet officer would do that. They would, even though he's a bad guy, they would have tried to rescue him because we try to save everybody's life. But here's a captain who blew up his whole ship and crew and yet is still captain somehow. And yeah. now he's going to leave. This. It fits for how they're shaping Lorca up, but it doesn't it fit fits for, for Lorca, Star Trek. Yeah. 
And I think it fits. I think it does fit in Star Trek in the sense of big, big, big picture. I think like okay. once, you know, we move forward, I think big picture, it will fit in. And for me, this episode is an interesting one because as much as what happens with Lorca and Lorca being such a distinct take on a captain and not quite fitting the Starfleet mold that we've seen up to this point, I feel like everything that happens aboard the Discovery feels very Star Trek. Do you agree oh, that, yeah. the, that the Discovery storyline feels like, okay, this is identifiable Trek? So the Star Trek story, the the the, the Discovery storyline on the ship, I loved. I loved yeah. how here's Burnham recognizing the issue with the tardigrade. She's trying to save this creature's life. It's a sentient creature. We should not be doing this. And she's trying her best to do it, but nobody will listen to her because she's got no rank. She's this horrible person. Nobody will listen to her. So I love she has how no she rank. She to... technically doesn't report to anybody. Right. But I love she how apparently she, it, she tries there to go to Lorca. As Lorca's pet. Yeah, she tries to go to talk to Lorca, but Lorca's not there. And Saru's just like, nope, get out of here. And so then she starts yeah. going through the whole process of, let me get the doctor. Let me have the doctor help me kind of prove that something's happening to the tardigrade. And then let me yeah. go to, you know, Stamets and let me use that ammunition from the doctor who happens to be <laughs> Stamets' husband, <laughs> like partner. Let me see if I can convince him. And if I can convince him, then I can get things rolling. So she's using just logic, playing the situation as best she can. I, I love that. And the fact yeah. that all of these characters reluctantly came along and you could see how the doctor was kind of like reluctantly working with her. And then the doctor clicked in because the doctor was like, she's right. We shouldn't be yeah. doing this. And then Stamets being like, get out of here. And then he has that epiphany of like, oh, she's right. So it was fun to see all the characters kind of clicking into Burnham's point of view, having this reminder of that Star Trek has a higher ideal for what we stand for. And mm -hmm. all of these characters kind of resonating and making that statement along the way was, I thought yeah. was great. I loved it. Stamets's approach to all of this initially, I didn't know which way his character would go, but then when he ultimately is like that, we can't do this to this creature. Yeah. His, his pursuit of truth has a limit. He won't do it to something else. He puts himself in that position. So, As so this a is the dramatic first... twist at the at the end of the episode, which yeah. I really liked. This is the first episode where I'm like, I'm now on Team Stamets because, like, up until this point, he's just come across as a persnickety, yeah. kind of nasty kind of character, and this is the first one where you get a glimpse of him of like he is definitely on board with doing the right thing, and that he's even willing to put himself at dire risk to do that right thing. He sacrifices himself, not yeah. knowing what's going to happen. He sacrifices himself. And so it's what like, we see I, is the giant water so bear. Much about him. Yeah. What we see is the giant water bear is being tortured effectively every time that they use it. And Saru is given the unenviable mission. You have to go find your captain because if he reveals the secrets of what the drive is, that will be a problem. So this is from Starfleet as much a, we got to rescue our person as we, as it is we can't let our secrets fall into enemy hands. So they have to go find Lorca and Saru has one major tool at his disposal, which is that spore drive. And the difficulty is everybody on the crew is slowly coming to the realization that the spore drive is not sustainable. Not only is it inhumane, but if they end up killing their engine or their navigator effectively, there goes that tool. So while Saru turns, says a flat no, he is also beginning to question himself. There is a very nice sequence between him and Burnham. I love the sequence oh, yeah. where he says, you make me question myself. You make me second guess myself. And that is a problem. And he sets the computer up to monitor his own behavior. I love mm -hmm. the sequence when he says to the computer, the reason I'm doing this is because there's an obstacle in my way that keeps making me question myself and the computer says what about removing the obstacle and he's like that's not possible so it's this i've got this burnham in front of me how do i deal with a burnham i have to figure out if i know what i'm doing so his story is extremely compelling and beautifully rendered very briefly i'm really yes. impressed in this episode 
they managed to do multiple things. One is introduce the doctor. We've seen the doctor in a couple of scenes, but we've never seen the doctor hold a conversation in the way they do in this episode. Mm -hmm. And they reveal the doctor and Stamets are in a relationship. They let the doctor's professionalism shine through in his ability to identify what is happening to the tardigrade. We're able to see Burnham effectively coalesce a group in support of her argument. Mm -hmm. We see Stamets humanized. We see Saru struggling with the captaincy and we see Tilly once again, stepping into her own professionalism of she, there's a reason why she's there. She's mm -hmm. cast in the light of being comedic relief. She does little things like when she sits down with Burnham at the lunchroom and jokingly makes comments that are effectively yes. like, you don't have a choice. You're going to talk to me about your problems so that I can help you fix them because I just like not being the one in the room who's causing the problem. And that's all <laughs> funny. But then yes. in the same episode, it shows Stamets and Burnham and Tilly problem solving the issue of how to get around the fact that the tardigrade is going to be killed by the process they're using. Okay. Can, can, and you can end I up with for a, a very quotable moment for me. Well, it's, there's the sequence with the three of them and engineering talking. And I don't know if you had this, the first 60 seconds of that entire scene. I wanted to throw something at the TV because it was some of the worst exposition ever. Oh, absolutely. it was like yeah. this, it was like a entire recap of, if you haven't seen the first three episodes, here's what's happened on Star Trek discovery. And they walk through the whole, like what the spore drive is and how it works. And like, it's yep. like, this is a streaming television show that people are binge watching. What <laughs> are you doing? This 60 seconds is completely unnecessary. Yeah. That, it got me very frustrated, but that yeah. scene after that, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> it the scene turns the corner as soon as Tilly says this is fo so fucking cool. Yes. For me. It's the it's that moment where she is well, just you... like so jazzed by the fact that they're doing stuff that nobody has ever done before and I like that Stamets turns to her and calmly says, "Yes, this is." Like this is well, the this, reason this... why he's there. So how do you feel about swearing on Star Trek now? This is the I'm first show that. that's had yeah. I'm I know some people it. had problem with it, but yeah. the way they used it, I thought was very effective because it was, it, it showed the exuberance and so like just the unadulterated excitement she's having. Yeah. And I did like that Stamets turns to her and kind of looks like a, she, he, like he's about to chide her and put her right. down, but he's like, no, this is fucking cool. It's like, I, I yeah. liked that little sequence right there. It was, it was the perfect way to use swearing yeah. to kind of add emphasis. There's a reason why, and it, and it's, I, this is one of the things I really love about this scene. There has to be a reason why somebody like Stamets would have somebody like Tilly in the room with him. Yep. Yep. And yep. it's not because she makes him laugh. It's not because he thinks she's charming. It is because when he looks at her, he's like, she nerds out as hard as I do. I like that as their connective tissue. That moment I thought was really nicely rendered. And I also liked the response that they have collectively to the problem solving of, of spitballing. It's terrible exposition in that first 60 seconds. It stands out as it might as well have just frozen on the face of them. And then a scroll could have gone up yeah. describing how everything works and then gone back into the sequence. But them, the doctor, everybody touching base with each other and compiling information, really gathering information that Saru doesn't have a choice, but to ignore. Mm -hmm. It creates this really strong, okay, Burnham is finding her place. She's finding herself at the center as the hub with all these people on the, the, the surrounding her. And yet ultimately it isn't enough of an argument because Saru has a job to do and he has to balance actually destroying the spore drive that they have in order to complete the mission. And he makes hard choices and has hard conversations with Burnham and everybody involved. One of my favorite scenes in this is when he looks like he's talking to the doctor and says, there's no choice. You have to do this thing. And the doctor says, I won't be a part of this. And he says, I wasn't talking to you. And it's all yeah. about Stamets. 
And Stamets is finds himself probably, I, I don't know how you felt about this, but I was like, Stamets was probably already headed this direction anyway. Yes. Of well, wanting to plug himself when, in. When he says in that, in that scene, he goes, okay. The yeah. look on his face is like completely like, all right, you asked for it. You could tell he was already had something in mind. But at the as a viewer watching this for the first time, you're kind of like, well, that's kind of an odd reaction for him to have. Just like in front yeah. of his partner and like you'd think he'd be fighting for it. But the fact he didn't, he just kind of rolled over and took it. As a viewer, I remember watching this the first time. I was like, well, that's a little off. And then when you see what happens is like, oh, oh, he was planning to inject himself and become the, the spore drive himself. Yes. So he becomes the spore drive. He ends up saving the day because they're able to they're able to follow what little trail they have to a location where they're able to then find Lorca and Ash Tyler, who they haven't met yet, being chased in small Klingon fighter ships. And they're able to, to identify them because Saru is able to look at those ships and be able to say, when you have predators all swarming after one thing like that, that one thing is going to be the the one being pursued. And so this is not an attack vector. This is a, a flee and pursuit chase. And they're able to identify Lorica, beam him and Tyler out and get them aboard the discovery and get out before they can be attacked by the Klingons. So now the entire family is back together and everybody's happy except for that poor tardigrade, which has this <laughs> breathtaking scene where it basically expels all the water from its body and shrinks down to the size of like a, a suitcase, <laughs> like, like a suitcase or a, yeah. I was going to say something like a, a, like a yoga ball. It's, it's yeah. this kind of like super hard shell and it pulls in on itself. And it's at this stage that everybody involved is looking at this thing and saying, well, we're clearly killing this. There's no debating this anymore. Mm -hmm. So we end the episode with Saru having given one final order to Burnham, which is find a solution for our tardigrade problem. And her solution is to release it. And we end up with what is a fine departure to a, what is effectively a MacGuffin for the series. Yeah. This oh, yeah. thing that is the all knowing navigator that's plugged in the mycelium network. That's able to see all of the universe and take them anywhere just disappears in a blink of light. And it's a fine departure. And I think what's interesting to me is originally in early conceptions of this show, that tardigrade was going to be a permanent member of the crew and it was going oh, to I'm have a they... name. It was not going to be called Ripper. <laughs> it was going to be called something else. I believe it was going to be Ephraim. And it was going to be a regular element of the series. And I think that there's a part of me that can't even express how relieved I am that they didn't go that direction. There was a show that already did that, Sean. It's called Farscape. But uh, glad they didn't do that because by not doing that, it strengthens the whole argument of why did we not hear of this type of ship before in all of Star Trek? They've just shown it. It's like, well, we can't find another tardigrade and this tardigrade is dying. We have to, you know, find a different method. And now it's like, oh, well, we can affect DNA and we can put, there's nobody else this will affect. It has to be a higher end species, something that's sentient that can take this. Well, that's only us. And it's like, well, we can't do that because that's augments has, that's augmenting DNA, which is now illegal. So they're setting all these things up for, this is why Discovery is a boutique ship. It's, yeah. it's one of a kind, and this is why we haven't seen it before, and this is why we never see it again, because it's so specialized and just unique that it can't be replicated. This is where it starts to make sense. If they kept the tardigrade around, I don't know, it, to me, kind of like undercuts that a little bit, because this is just like, an, it's just layering on all the reasons why we can't keep doing this. It's like, right. we can't find tardigrades. Oh, and it kills them. So it's like there's like by doing that, I think it strengthens the argument for why this is a unique situation. And then post releasing of the tardigrade, we get a, a getting ready for bed sequence where we see the doctor <laughs> and we see Stamets brushing their teeth and having a heart to heart conversation. It's a nice conversation between a couple that is mm -hmm. the first reveal that we've seen that the doctor and Stamets are in this kind of relationship because every time we've seen them previously, the doctor seems really put out by Stamets mm -hmm. and they seem to have some sort of history there. 
now we're seeing, okay, it's not history, it's current events. They're in a relationship. And what we're seeing is the doctor basically looking at Stamets and saying, you're either a dick all the time or you do stupid shit and stop it. Yeah. And yeah. so here we have that moment of a loving partner say, you can't do stuff like that to yourself. And Stamets's response I knew you'd try and stop me, but I knew we didn't have a choice. So this is an episode of a lot, again, like last week, a lot of people making choices between the lesser of two terribles. You know, I, I can either not get into that chamber and then we all die because the Klingons will kill us, or I get in and potentially really hurt myself. So which is the better choice? And, <laughs> you know, Saru yeah. is in a position of like, I'm taking my ship into a place where everybody in my crew is telling me we can't keep using this engine, but I have no choice. We have to go in and do this thing. So we end up with the two of them brushing their teeth and it's a nice enough conversation. It's all fine. But the ultimate the ending. takeaway is yeah. something kind of, I'm going to argue that the ending is not literal. It's poetic for the viewer. Yes. Because what happens cannot happen. But no. what happens, I think we can also very quickly interpret as to what is happening. Yes. So what we see I, is I, I loved it. I Stamets loved it. brushing his teeth. <laughs> yeah. His partner says, promise me you won't do that again. He says, I promise, puts down his toothbrush, leaves the room. And the camera reveals that in the mirror, Stamets is still standing there studying himself with a look on his face that says he's kind of ruminating about what's just happened but he's yeah. not there the reflection remains until it also turns and walks away so we have seen a mirror be for, perform in a way that mirrors cannot perform i remember watching this and in that moment immediately concluding we're looking at a mirror universe so so I take it as not a literal Stamets' mirror was literally doing that. I think it's a wink to the audience that you guys know what's coming. Yes, I, I agree with you. I love this ending. I thought it was the perfect ending to this. Remember how in the last episode I talked about how the ending felt anticlimactic. It didn't feel like it really wrapped up the heart of what the episode was about. It just kind of felt yeah. like it kind of petered out, stopped. This is the kind of ending that I expect out of a streaming show nowadays. It's like all the major plot lines of the episode that were set up are concluded, but there's something, a thread that is continuing into the next episode that's teased to make you want to hit the next episode button. This ending grabs you, man. It's like, it yeah. is so great with him going, I'm totally fine. I'm fine. I promise you. And they turn to go to bed together and then it turns around and he's just like got that blank stare in his face. As a viewer, you're like, oh no, yeah. it, it grabs you <laughs> yeah. so thoroughly, but it's something new that doesn't feel like it's cheated the episode's ending. So that's yeah. kind of what this, I and think, is born a great entirely episode. of the episode. Yes. It wouldn't have, so, you know, that this is the conclusion yes. of Stamets having done this thing to himself. And he yes. says in describing his experience, I was able to see everything and it was yep. beautiful. And in that moment of rapture, then seeing the mirror reflection stay in the room tells mm -hmm. you it wasn't all beautiful. Something mm -hmm. has happened. Something fundamental has happened. This entire thing is about the events of the, of the episode. There's also another bow wrapped around another story element, which I also equally enjoyed. And it's the conversation between Saru and Burnham where Burnham has the telescope and gives it to Saru. She gives it to him because he is the literal manifestation of Giorgio's hopes that she, Burnham, did not fulfill. So she mm -hmm. passes the mantle onto Saru and says to him, you did a good job. You did what a captain needs to do. And you are ready for the role you have. And Saru reveals, as opposed to the previous episode, where he basically used his role as first officer to burn Burnham. He said, like, I'm going to do a better job at this, at this than you did mm -hmm. in this episode. He says, I'm saddled with a captain who is not teaching me how to captain. You had Giorgio who was clearly grooming you to be a captain. And I first saw my path being filling your void when you would leave, because it was clear you were going to become a captain and that would be my opportunity to move up. And then you blew that all up by creating this war. Yep. And now I'm left with a captain who is a madman and I do not have the opportunity to learn. 
And she says, you already have, you were with Giorgio as well. And you've learned and you clearly are ready for this role. So yeah. it's a nice bridge building moment between those two characters. And I really like that. It's not a, we forgive each other or you forgive me for what happened in the past, but it is about, there's a hard line behind us, which is history. And we can either keep turning around and facing that and looking at that, or we can turn away from it, understand that it's there and then move forward into the future. And it, it feels yep. like for both these characters, this is the moment where Burnham has been looking for this. She's been looking for, I don't know how to move forward. She kind of stumbles upon it in this episode of answering questions and building a team around her organically. But for Saru, it is a conscious choice. I like that the two of them yep. are both now facing forward, but one on instinct, and it's not him. They keep pointing out that he has the instinctive detection yeah. for danger, but he's not the one operating on instinct in this. He's operating from a place of having to internally say to himself, I can't keep dragging her through the glass because she screwed things up. I also need to recognize that there are things in her that I can learn from. So yep. it's this kind of unofficial mentorship that's going both directions. She needs a friend. She needs an ally who knows her and he needs the experience and he needs the, the understanding of somebody who's been in the similar role. And there's nobody else yep. on the ship who can do that for her, for him, but her. So it's the beginning of a nice pairing between the two of them. Every, show has yep this the pairing. there's always yep. the pairing there there you and you have uh, so much energy and strength comes from from that from the storytelling and i think on enterprise to paul and archer created that i think that in this we're seeing the first hint that it's not going to be Lorca. Lorca is not that hinge for the pairing it is these two these two with a lot of history behind them, but now figuring out what does our future look like, if not what we expected. Yep. And I really like that ending. Me too. So as we move forward, the next time we're talking, we're going to talk about the episode leave and viewers as before, I invite you to jump into the comments and give us some wrong answers only as to what leave will be about. And We'll try to incorporate those into next week's episode. And before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you wanted to share about what's coming up on your main channel with our listeners? Well, the episode coming up that's out actually at the time this episode comes out is about my new home and I'm having a geothermal or ground source heat pump system put in. And I have a video about the drilling of a 400 foot well and what it's like going through that process. That's going to be out there. So I found it fascinating. It was, it was really cool. What sounds interesting about the drilling of that well is even if it goes poorly, it goes well. As for me, okay. you can check out my website, seanferrell.com. <laughs> Look for my books there or just go directly to whatever bookstore or public library you might want to and ask for them. They're available anywhere. And keep an eye out for my next book, The Sinister Secrets of Singe, which is coming out in the first week in June 2023. And as I mentioned before, as I start having some events in public, I will drop information about them here. And if anybody's interested, I'd love to see you swing by a bookstore where I might be doing a reading and or signing. If you'd like to support the show, please consider reviewing us on Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever it was you found this, go back there, leave a review. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends. And if you'd like to directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show, click the become a supporter button. It allows you to throw coins at our heads. We appreciate the bruises. And when you do that, it immediately makes you an ensign, which means you will be subscribed to our spinoff show, Out of Time, where we talk about things that don't fit within the confines of this program. So we talk about other sci-fi. Sometimes we talk about horror, sometimes fantasy, sometimes books, comics, TV shows, movies, whatever it is that we are paying attention to at that time, we talk about. We hope you'll be interested in checking that out. All of that really does help support the show. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening or watching. We'll talk to you next time.